into Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. When it comes to uh, trying and analyzing what's happening within the global logistics uh, industry, uh, it would probably take a lifetime to understand 2021. There are cyclones which are disrupting port operations. There is COVID situation which has forced some of the largest ports in the, in the world to shut shop, shut operations for a couple of weeks. As I understand, of course, the Chinese port has just reopened. But nevertheless, that throws the wheels of balance for sure. Add to that, for the last three months at least, if not longer, we've heard multiple stories about how high container rates and freight rates have been. So much so that some of the largest companies in India tell me that at times the cost of the container is more than the cost of goods within that container as well. So, so we thought it's best to get in somebody who, while operates a local entity, thinks global, is based out, and can give us, a, give us um, maybe a bird's eye view and an in-depth view of the global situation and then nail it down to what's happening within India as well, which might excite him and which might worry him at the same time. Yes, so the conversation today is with Jakob Fries Sorensen. He heads Gujarat Pipa Port and joins in right now to talk about his perspective on the same. Jakob, good, ha good having you. And I presume you are in Denmark. I hope all is safe out there. All is safe. Thank you. It's uh, harvest time here in, uh, in Denmark. The weather is, is, is changing as usual. We are getting rain and sunshine, but uh, it, every, everything's fine here. Thank you. And thanks for having me, Nirat. Now the pleasure is ours. Uh, Jacob, I would love to talk about uh, Gujarat Pipawa Water One as well. We'll just get to Gujarat Pipawa in a moment. Can I first start off with how do you see the global perspective considering all that's happening? I mean, there's just so much, uh, so many moving parts, including port shutdowns due to COVID and the freight rates, which are sky high. Yeah, you started out saying that it will take a lifetime, but um, I, I have been active in logistics for 30 years, and I cannot remember um, this much disruption internationally as, as we are seeing at the moment. And it's really a host of, of, of a lot of things. You mentioned COVID, and uh, COVID is making a lot of problems for shipping lines. Um, just imagine the crew changes when you have uh, people traveling around the world. Um, we have a lot of Indian sailors on board the international merchant fleet and um, their travel challenges. Uh, are they vaccinated? Can they entry a port or a country for, for, for being relieving colleagues? Uh, people have been on board for over a year on, in, in some cases. So that alone is, is a big disruption. And then comes the, um, as you also mentioned, when terminals are being shut down, like we've seen in China and Ningbo, They've been shut down for a couple of weeks here due to COVID. That have a massive knock-on effect on delays and the um, unpredictability at the moment for us as a port is, is like you really wish you had that crystal ball. Um, then take uh, just inventories in uh, Europe, in the US. Um, goods are being torn off the shelves. Uh, people are ordering online. And um, warehouses at the same time are full with the stuff that people are not buying. And so you end up having containers standing in the port. Uh, even that is not cheap, but people have no choice. They don't have anywhere to put the goods uh, that they have ordered. And we don't get the empty containers back, uh, which adds up to, it, in fact, all the problems that you just mentioned that freight rates are going high because it's a real supply and demand market out there. But there's also shortages of empty containers. There's shortages of, of uh, uh, shipping space. And we in the ports, we are basically a little bit sitting ducks because uh, you really wish you had that crystal ball to be able to look into the future and, and see when, when, when uh, uh, your next ship is going to arrive because there's delays. And the shipping lines are trying to get back to schedule by omitting certain ports and, and getting back to a, a regular uh, service. Uh, so there's just so many things happening at the moment. Um, you yeah. um, probably remember, you remember the ship that went the ground in the Suez Canal. And that had the world attention, right? Uh, and it, it was just a small fragment of all the upsetting factors that that is really... Uh, 
uh, you know, amalgamated, it's getting into a, a big quagmire of, of issues here. Uh, and I think it's unfortunately also going to last for long. It's not good, just going to be ironed out in a couple of weeks here. This is going to take time uh, to really get back into a, a, a normalization, that, that, as we all hope it will. Yeah. So when, when you say it might take time, Jacob, you, you reckon this is a few months out and even that might be at best a guess, I understand. But I still want an informed guess from you. It, it's it's a guess, but uh, you know we were sitting we were sitting in 2020 and hoping that COVID was over. We couldn't get, we couldn't wait to get into 2021, right? And 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 what do we think about 2021 now, right? Uh, is 2022 going to be better? And I I'm afraid to to make any uh, predictions, but I do believe that we have to face that this is going to take much longer than 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 we realize, and we need maybe to understand that this is a new normal. Wow. Okay. And, and, and in which case, uh, Jacob, I'm just trying to understand, not just, I, I, I know you, you, you look at the ports business, but I'm sure you've got such an uh, area of ex, uh, experience and information or opinion on the other aspect as well, which is what a lot of Indian companies and arguably global companies have been talking about and in a soft way complaining about the kind of uptick in rates, volatility in rates, and just the, the upper nudging that comes into container rates, uh, to freight rates, do you reckon uh, that will stay elevated at least for the better part of 2021, if not longer? I, I'm afraid to say so, yes, because um, as you know, I'm just looking around me. Prices are going up. Um, there's definitely everybody is adding on those freight costs um, to the landed goods prices, correct? Yeah. And if you check another sector like uh, the construction and building uh, segment, uh, everybody's screaming they don't have raw materials. They are looking for all kind of produ products to to finish uh, building of houses and and constructing uh, roads and factories and stuff like that. So. Um, the knock-on effect is um, really, it's not rocket science. Obviously, who's going to pay? It ends up being added up and it goes to the end consumers. Um, so um, I, I think uh, it's not only an Indian issue. It's, it's really a problem that everybody's sitting with in the world. Some people are lucky to be in a business where uh, they can cope with these problems and they can sell and they can make a lot of money and other uh, sectors are badly hit um, and I think it's shifted a little bit because if you look at it uh, you go back last year we were all talking about that it's the services it's the restaurants and it's it's the travel industry that's suffering I think now it's really moved into the real economy uh, of of um, nuts and bolts and spare parts and and uh, all kind of, of of things that that is now seeing this uh, effect here Jacob, in which, in which case it's safe to assume that if I'm an ordinary company operating wherever, and recently I think uh, we at Bloomberg uh, put out this chart that um, goods, uh, I'm forgetting what was the nature of the commodity, but the commodity costed about $1,000 in Asia, and by the time it reached Europe or US, the cost went up to almost two and a half times simply because of the container rates and the freight rates. But what I'm trying to get at is that if if I'm an ordinary manufacturer and if the cost of my raw materials is going to be so high, it naturally leads to the prices of my end product being high as well, which at, at best would be uh, mildly inflationary in nature and in all probability would be very, very inflationary in nature going ahead. Yeah, I, I think that uh, still sticks. And, and don't forget, it's not only the ocean freight rates it's also the inefficiencies when you get to europe or you get to united states um as i mentioned warehousing space is really hard to get um you need uh, people to unload the containers you need to have a put place to put it and stuff like that and other um other companies are, are reporting that uh, they're out of stock and the goods are just torn off the shelves so the, the other point to make here is that it's really imbalanced and some 
some uh, products are really out of stock and you could sell it for, for three or four times the price if you had it. And, and as I said, you also have over inventory of, of other goods that are not selling uh, in these times here. Um, so, so it's really um, a lot of combinations of things. And that's also why I say it's going to be a, taking a long time before this is, is ironed out because it's not just fixing one thing, it's fixing a lot of things in, in the same time. Um, uh, speaking of uh, trying to fix things, well, some things happen naturally, like for you in the quarter gone by and Gujarat people of port, of course, um, uh, while, while the, the average realizations, I believe due to a favorable cargo mix were doing well, did well, you were hit by, by, by the cyclone, which impacted probably 15, 20 days of your operations. I saw revenues were flattish. YOY as well, despite a volume decline, though, which was a good thing. Can you talk a bit about what the experience was in quarter one or arguably the last couple of quarters field in India at Gujarat Pipawa? First of all, I'd like to say I'm so happy that nobody got uh, seriously injured and we didn't lose a single person during the cyclone. Because again, here it 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 was, yeah, it was the 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 worst storm I have ever experienced. And um I, I recall I had a storm experience 30 years ago in the North Sea, but this was really um, a natural phenomenon that potentially we're going to see it again because of the climate change we are facing. Um, so yes, we were, and I think we were very fortunate in in, in Pipavav port that uh, we were out of um, operations for only two two weeks. We managed to restore um, power and electricity and communication. Uh, by ourselves, and um, uh, you know, parts of Gujarat didn't have power for two months, uh, so we were really lucky, and that again um, probably helped us in a way that we were, of course, not the only ones affected by the storm. So while while we know that we lost some business, but other customers were also affected by the storm, and they couldn't deliver the cargo to the port, or their warehouse got damaged, or or, or something like that. Um, but uh, financially, yes, we are we are definitely um, feeling that that uh, we both had loss of revenues. And speaking of of building uh, up again here, we have a lot of repairs to do. Um, and now we do everything uh, in a higher dimension so that we can withstand um, a similar storm coming in the future. So that means we are upping all our specs and we are doing things uh, like our training system is going to be even better our power supply and our backup systems for electricity and communication is going to be uh, even on a higher level so we can uh, withstand this because uh, we need to be prepared for for anything that can affect us and and all of that of course costs money um there's a question mark on what how much is covered insurance wise so um there is a there is a net impact on that but but having said that i'm i'm really happy to say our customers understood and we've seen uh, business coming back very fast, especially in the non-container area, which is um, everything from coal, limestone, fertilizer, uh, even uh, export of, of build-up vehicles have now taken up. Uh, so there are some, uh, you know, when you run a, a multi-port like ours, uh, we have some ups and downs, and that is uh, helping us to hedge overall on our uh, performances and I think uh, our owners and investors uh, can also see that in the result. But the first quarter uh, this year was uh, definitely affected, and I think we've taken the punch now. And uh, you will see that there will be some small impacts as we as we take in repair costs and so on uh, over the rest of the year. But the the impact of the repair cost because I believe there was there was a fair degree of damage. That notwithstanding, you reckon volumes are shaping up better in, in the first couple of months of this new quarter uh, because there was a 10 odd percent volume growth decline. Do you think that is picking up? And do you think that because I saw the last two weeks business activity also seemed to be reasonably okay, the latest data that came out. Is it showing in the way uh, the months of uh, uh, you know uh, July and August have shaped up? Yeah. I, I think we are quite confident to say that that the volumes are stable and we are, we are coming back. And I also think uh, 
the container volumes are coming are coming back to us. Um, and and what really also keeps me um, optimistic here is that we continue to build on the DFC. Uh, we are ready in the port again. Of course, the, 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 the cyclone had a, an impact and, and we had to do some repairs. Um, as you probably know, uh, Niraj, the, um, the DFC and also our PRCL, People of Rail Corporation, uh, link up to uh, Surinder Nagar is uh, electrified as also. I was cl- glad to see that the prime minister noticed that recently in a statement that he said uh, the electrified uh, railway tracks is, is going to be uh, an improvement for for India. And I truly believe that it's going to help us in stabilizing. Uh, it's going to, first of all, um, help ship us to, to have a more predictable uh, flow of cargo. When we see the DFC is up and running, uh, we can basically run a train between Pipevav and, uh, and the north in uh, 24 hours. Um, so it's a, a reduction of the transit time, but it's also a predictable transit time that we can deliver. Uh, secondly, it's going to be cheaper. We don't know how much, but we are definitely pushing and we are expecting that um, going just from running the engines on electricity and not on diesel, uh, we will see an operating decline in, in, the, um, in the cost. And then... Um, don't forget also that we are attracting cargo from the roads to rail, which is uh, clearly a, a, a much better environmental footprint. And again, uh, the railways are not that in, dependent on, on drivers like, like we have seen on the trucks um, and the roads, uh, which again is a little bit of a COVID-related issue. But I think also in the long run, it, it adds up to this predictability that I'm uh, saying that the DFC is a game changer in the long run. So we're spending a lot of time on the stakeholders. We are analyzing together with uh, our, our, our colleagues. Uh, we are finding out how do we manifest these benefits and how do we make it clear to customers, to shipping lines, to freight forwarders, to manufacturers, to importers, exporters, and how do we um, work with them to, to really harvest some of these benefits because it's a redesign of the entire supply chain and the way they possibly do business today. And, and Niraj, as you know, any change uh, is going to take some time. But here I really see no losers. I, I, I really see this is going to benefit India. Uh, hopefully India is going to be more competitive in the international uh, uh, competition. Uh, and I, I mentioned the trucking companies before, but really, instead of making one trip long haul uh, in five or six days, uh, trucking companies are now able to do five trips a day in the near markets. And hopefully we can reach out peripheral areas, uh, especially in the north. If you go beyond Haryana and so forth, uh, there, there are areas which potentially did not have uh, trucking services in the past. And now we can. Uh, reallocate the fleet to do the shorter trips um, into the ICDs and and then hopefully more players uh, and more customers. Well, uh, cross fingers for that. But I was going to ask you, uh, and and maybe the final question on this interaction, uh, about the competitive intensity out here. So the DFC is um, probably going to be a big, uh, if not a game changer, then a big differentiator for you for sure. But you are in an area which is dominated by either the government ports, but more specifically, the largest private port operator in the country. And, and their ports are in and around you. How difficult it is? What is the nature of the competitive intensity when you have two large competitive forces around you and you still have to uh, go ahead and perform to your best? How difficult? How challenging? Can you tell us a bit about that? I, I think it's a good spot to be in, to be honest, because uh, uh, the government is working hard to do privatization, um, not only in the port industry, but in, in a lot of, 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 the, of, the, of the services that the government has been doing, which is a little bit of disruption to the private sector when you are working and depending on a, on a government service. Um, and talking about um, private large operators, I, I don't think India really wants monopoly. So competition is good. And um, we, and, and I say now, we, the AP Moller Merce Group, is definitely committed to India. Um, and, and when 
Uh, we see the privatization. There's a bit going on now in JNPT for um, another terminal. Um, we are looking beyond Pipavava as well, uh, but we are also looking to see what can we do in the near market around Pipavava. Can we establish uh, uh, warehousing and, and maybe um, special economic zones that will uh, induce industries to locate nearer to our port? And I think India is, is, is such a developing and big market that um, this is a good space to be in. There's really yeah. room for growth. There's room for growth and there's room for everybody. Sorry, can I just come in there? And which is what has intrigued me. I've looked at now Gujarat Pipa ports for more than 10 years. Uh, you guys have GBPL and then, correct me if I'm wrong, but not enough presence built beyond that. I mean, is it, and, and India was always an attractive destination as it is now, maybe even eight years or 10 years ago. Why is it that you haven't, if you indeed believe that India is such a great market? And do you reckon that that will change meaningfully? Will we see evidence of that in the next couple of years, you think, from the APM group? It's clear to me that um, maybe a, a few years back, we didn't really know um, what the purpose was with, with the port. Uh, but as you know, I've joined in 2020 and um, they asked me to come in. I was uh, based in Indonesia before and, and um, I said yes immediately because... Um, I've been in India as well uh, in my past career, and I knew the potential. And, and I think uh, now we are getting a very clear road ahead. So forget about the past, Niraj. I, I would look into the future. Uh, that's what we um, hopefully will have a, a say and a control in, in shaping. And um, definitely, there's a lot of room for, for India in the many, many years to come uh, to continue to develop. And, and what I find exciting is also why we have the tagline Gujarat Green Gateway, is that the, the, the sustainable transformation, the green economy, is definitely a spot where we want to be as well. Um, we have solar panels on our warehouse roofs. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, electrified the railway connectivity. We have a lot of other initiatives uh, to make the environment a better place. And, uh, and um, at the same time, it's not something that we think is going to cost money. In fact, I think we will derive uh, efficiencies out of these uh, green investments that we want to do. So um, I, I really think that we are in a good spot. Also, given all the turmoil, given all the dark clouds that we are facing at the moment, and um, you have seen also how um, the climate is changing. There's no doubt about it. We experienced this uh, cyclone, Taute, and... Um, I, I wouldn't even say it's a wake-up call. We know that it's 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 affected. And what I'm excited about is that I can see the things that we can do as a green port, which will have a positive effect way beyond our uh, borders, but it'll affect people all over India in a small way. But with the size of India, this is going to have a, a you know global footprint as well as we can have a cleaner energy and a cleaner uh, transportation system in India, you don't need to repeat some of the mistakes that we have done in the West um, because we have better technologies today. And uh, if we can go away from fossil, fossil fuels and, and we can find some renewables or some non-polluting ways to transport our goods, uh, at the same time, do that at a cheaper way, I actually think India is going to gain a lot on the competitive uh, in in the competitive international markets as well. Okay, Jacob, uh, really appreciate you taking the time out and speaking to us on a variety of issues. Uh, we do hope the world normalizes sooner rather than later. Though so speaking to you, I fear that 2021 is still going to be more of the same. But yes, thank you for joining me today and stay safe.